and I'm going to start in verse number 9 here in a minute. I'm going to teach you something tonight about God's will and about hearing from God. Somebody asked a question the other day about God's will and how to hear God and, and uh, how unfair it seems to be that God has demands on us but doesn't, um, but doesn't make his will known. But that's a problem uh, in, a, in a person's mind because God does make his will known very plainly to us. We can see his will, and God is very interested in you knowing his will. Uh, in every area. People say, well, I'm just looking for God's will. Well, God's will is not that hard to find. It really isn't. Uh, sometimes we make it harder than what it actually is. Colossians chapter 1, I want you to see this. Paul did this in Ephesians, and he did it in Colossians as well, that when he heard about someone's faith, or he knew about someone that had gotten saved, one of the first things he began to do is pray that they would know the will of God for their life. And so when you look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 9, he says, for this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, heard about them receiving Christ and their faith, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You know what he wanted? He wanted you to have a complete understanding of knowledge of what the will of God was for your life that you would have spiritual understanding about how to walk in the will of God. In fact, the very next verse, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord in all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto uh, all patience and long suffering and joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So we, he wants us to have a complete inheritance and be able to have give, giving thanks for all the things that God's going to do. And look, all those things come, all those great blessings come from walking in the will of God for your life. You can't have all the blessings that come in your life. Somebody says, well, I thought you already said Ephesians 1 says we are blessed. You are blessed. But listen, you can't walk in the blessings that he has for you unless you learn to walk with Christ. You know what? Let me tell you something else. You have access to the throne of grace that you can talk to God anytime and you can find grace and mercy in time of trouble. You know, you've got that. You know, you have access to that. I mean, realize that same end. How many of you use it? Four or five of you. You know what? You've got access to some things that God wants you to have and wants you to have them richly. The problem is we don't walk into those things. We don't access those things. And one of them is blessings. And God wants you to have the blessings of your life. He wants you to be able to have every bit of the inheritance, every bit of the things he's got for you to have. You know, part of the inheritance, the earnest of your inheritance is the Holy Spirit of God. And do you realize he wants you to have everything? You, you listen to me, every saved person here this morning, this evening, he wants you to have everything that comes with you having the Holy Spirit in your life. He wants you to have all of it. In verse number 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That's what he's done. He's taken us out of darkness and put us into light in the kingdom of his dear son. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Look, he didn't pay for you. Listen real close. He didn't pay that ultimate price for you and give, shed his blood so that you could have an everlasting life and move you into the kingdom of his dear son and then leave you alone and never tell you what to do from that point forward. He wants you to know what to do now that you're saved. The problem is we're just not walking into the will of God. Paul's praying, people are praying, uh, uh, people in your life are praying that you would be able to walk in the will of God for your life. The problem is you're going to have to submit yourself to what God's trying to do in your life. Let me make a couple of statements. I'm going to give you at least a little bit of the introduction to help, help drive this point home and then take it into the will of God for your life. How many of you realize God's got a will when it comes to a lost person and that will is that they'd be saved? How many of you realize that? 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. If some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing. Now listen to me again. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Listen, how many is God willing should perish? 
is any of them, none of them, right? He wants how many? All to come to repentance. Just in case you're in here and you think, because you've read a book about the Bible instead of reading the Bible, that God only saves some people and not all people, well, I just read you the verse. Now, what you've got to get your mind wrapped around is some of the intelligent people in the world that you read their books might be wrong and the Bible might be right. God has a will. You know what His will is? That every lost person would trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. In 1 Timothy 2, 4, it says, Who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. That means that He wants how many? All men to be saved. You know, the Bible says what it means and means what it says. The reason why people arrive at different conclusions about the will of God when it comes to salvation is because they're reading books about the Bible instead of reading the Bible. The Bible clears up a whole lot of man's wisdom. So there's a will of God. You say, well, that's the will of God, but how does God get us towards that will? Well, He directs people towards His will. We talked about this a little bit today. Do you realize that creation, Romans chapter 1, creation is revealing who God is and showing people that there is a God? You can't walk around and look at trees growing and things everywhere. You can't look at a human eyeball and not realize there had to be an intelligent designer behind all these things. So creation, he's given you creation. You know why? Because he wants people to know the truth. He gave creation. You know what else he gave you? Romans chapter number 2, he gave you a conscience. He gave you a conscience to show you that there is a God and the conscience would convict you and show you even if you didn't have the law, even if you didn't have the commandments, you've got something inside you that's telling you that you are doing wrong. Who put that there? God put that there. Why? Because he wants you to come to him. He's not willing that any should perish. He's given his commandments. Romans chapter 3, so that every mouth may be stopped and everybody may be guilty before God. He's given us commandments. You know what else he does? Romans chapter 2, the goodness of God leadeth us to repentance. The circumstances God puts us in in his life, in our life, they're there for a reason to try to drive us to him. Now with all those things, you know what else he puts? He puts concerned people in our life. Paul said in Romans chapter 10, he said, my desire for Israel is that they might be saved. He'll put people in our lives that have a desire to lead us to Christ. Now listen, if God didn't care about people being saved, he wouldn't have gone through that much trouble. Listen, somebody can't get to heaven and say, I just didn't know. Uh, You are without excuse. That's God's will. So God just didn't throw people out there in the world and then say, well, just figure it out for yourself. Run around blind and just bump into walls and see if you can figure it out. No, he has put things in place to try to point you towards his will for a lost person. But let me make a statement to you. God does not force his will. God will not make you do His will. God could have created a lot of robots, but there would be no relationship with a robot. And God wants a relationship. And so He won't force it. And so when people, I'll give you another verse, 2 Thessalonians 2.10, it says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. You know what the problem is? The problem is not with God. The problem is with the heart of man. It's not the fact that God chose that you can be saved, but you can't be saved, and you can be saved, and you can't be saved. That's not what God did. God is wanting all men to be saved. And if you stand before God and say, I never received you, it's not God's fault. It's your own heart's fault. But without excuse. So God won't, won't force it. And so you can either receive the blessing and eternal life that comes with salvation, or you know what you can do? You can reject it. And you can face the consequences of rejecting the will of God for a lost person. God's not going to force you to do something. I I, I say a lot of stuff with the Calvinism stuff, but Calvinism always tries to slip into a church and covertly try to change everybody's heart and makes it dead as a hammer. In Matthew 23, 37, it says this, and you can't get around these type of verses. It says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, O how I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, 
and ye would not. You know what God says? Jesus said there, I would gather you in. I want you to come in. But you would not do it. God's got a will for your life, and God wants the best for your life. It's not God's fault that we're not doing the thing that we're supposed to be doing. It's our own fault. It's our heart. In Acts 7, when Stephen's speaking to all those guys there, he says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did so do you. You know what he's saying? You are resisting the will of God. It's not God's fault. It's your own heart's fault. And so let me make this statement. If you can see that plainly, and most of us can say amen to all that, because most people sitting in this room have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they can relate to all those things I just said to you. But just like God's got a will for your salvation and for your eternal life, He's got a will for your present life. And He doesn't hide that either. And people would say, it's just hard to figure out what God's will is. You know what's funny? This is, this is, it's, it's not really funny, it's sad. The Bible plainly says in several places, this is the will of God for you. And somebody says, well, I don't know what the will of God is. You've got some places where it says it plainly in black and white and easy, you know, easy to understand words. This is the will of God. I was teaching a class in the dungeon at Happy Valley in the, the, the uh, basement, they call it the dungeon. I was down in the basement with all the teenagers one, one time, and I was, the, I, don't think, I, feel, I was the youth pastor or what I was at the time, and I was talking to all of them. There was a crowd of men there. And, uh, and I said, how many of you want to know the will of God for your life? And every hand shot up. I'm going to tell you the will of God for your life. Man, they were all getting their notepads out, getting their pens, getting it all ready. They're, they're ready for the will of God. And I said, here it is. You ready for it? They said, yes. I said, this is the will of God even your sanctification, right up from the Word of God, that you should abstain from fornication. All of them went, oh, man, that's what... Oh. Now, let me tell you what's crazy is afterwards, some of them came to me and said, how did you know, and they had been all as a group doing some things they should not have been doing. And they all looked at each other like, how did he know that we were doing that? You know what? The will of God is not so hard to find. In 1 Peter 2.15, for this is the will of God, that with well-doing you might put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. God has a will. The verses surrounding it are the will of God for your life. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Giving thanks is the will of God. Staying away from fornication, that's the will of God. It's so simple. And so God's Word directs us. So let me give you a few things I want you to get a hold of this, this evening that will help you with figuring out the will of God for your life. Now, the problem's not going to be the problem's not gonna be in the sermon I'm going to give you because all the things are right there. The problem's going to be what are you going to do with it? How does God direct us towards His will? Just like He uses creation and conscience and commandments and circumstances and concerned people in our life to direct us towards Him for salvation. He's using some things in your life, if you're watching, He's using some things in your life to direct you towards His will for your life. One of them, the first one I'd like to give you is this, is the Scriptures. God gives you the Word of God in your life, and look, it's the perfect will of God in your life doesn't give you a flawed roadmap that you've got to connect some dots and try to figure it out and read four or five commentaries over here to figure it all out. He's just given you a perfect word of God that you can look into and figure out what the perfect God has when it comes to the perfect will for your life. He's given it to us. The problem people have sometimes, they just don't want to submit themselves to the truths of the word of God. To say, I'd rather just follow my heart. Your heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? You can't follow your heart. One day your heart's telling you one thing. The next day your heart's telling you a separate thing. And people just don't get it. I've had people ask me before. They've asked me questions about what, what do you think I should do with this situation? Well, what does the Bible say about it? And people sometimes, I've, I've, some, I've, I don't remember if I've, if I've experienced this. I can't remember if I experienced this or read this, but somebody said, uh, should I marry so-and-so? I, I really feel like I should marry this person. Well, are they saved? No. Are you saved? Yes. Do you, have you ever seen the verse that says, 
be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Yes, I've seen it. But I really feel like God's telling me to go ahead and marry this person. Problem. Here's the problem. The Spirit of God would never tell you anything different than the Word of God would tell you. Why? Because He wrote the Word of God. And so you've got the Word of God staring you right in the face. It says, don't yoke together. They're not a believer. And then you do it anyway. And then you face the consequences of dealing with all the issues that come with that. And then a little bit down the, lo- uh, down the road, somebody says, that same person says, I just really feel like it's God's will for me to divorce this person. Well, wait a minute. A year ago, you said it was God's will for you to marry that person. Let me show you some verses about this. Well, I'm not interested in what the Bible has to say about that either. And see, you can know the will of God for your life, if you would just open the Bible and read it. The scriptures are there for a reason. 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself to prove unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You've got to get the Bible into you so that you know what God wants for your life. You know the verse, Proverbs 3.5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thy own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. You can't, we don't need to be directing our own path. We need to figure out what God's Word says and then line ourselves up with what God's Word says for our path. Well, let me be honest with you, not try to be too mean, but at least, at least get in your lap a little bit with you tonight. Some of us never open our Bible so we don't ever know what the will of God is. I'm not trying to be super mean, but as long as I'm in your lap, I might as well sit down for a little while. I'm looking around the room, and most of you ain't got a Bible open in here tonight. That's a problem. That's a problem. How do you know that I'm telling you anything? If the Bible's not important to you, then then I'm going to tell you the truth. You will never know the will of God for your life. You will bounce like a pinball from this thing to that thing, from this thing to that thing, the rest of your life. And you will never know what God wants for you. And you'll hang your hat on a sermon or a part of a sermon you heard over here or something somebody said over there, and you will never know what God really wants for your life. You've got to be reading this thing. You've got to be reading it daily. I read it. I, was, and I give you this illustration all the time, but even your daily reading, God can tell you things that matter for that day. Proverbs 15, 17 says, A better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred there. Well, he said, well, that, that didn't do that for me. It did something for me on the 15th of, I don't even remember what month it was. It was on the 15th day of it, though. I was in Thailand, and we were and uh, we were getting ready. We were doing something, and I think the next day was going to be Stacy's dad's birthday, and they were going to be ordering food. We called back uh, back home. We said, "Well, what are you all doing?" They said, "Well, we're getting order, ordering food." And I think they were having food brought in from Natalita's or something. I think that's what it was. They were having food brought in from Natalita's, a Mexican restaurant down in Houston that we used to go to. We're having Mexican food brought in, and me and Stacy are sitting up there, and we're thinking Mexican food. Oh, that would be fantastic. Fajitas would be unbelievable. We're in Thailand. We're eating rice and green vegetables and sometimes pushing worms off to the side that were on the plate with us. And so we're thinking, man, man, that would be good. And we're sitting one day, and I'm thinking about it because this is, this is going to be happening in a couple of days now. And on the 15th, here I am thinking, man, it sure would be good to have fajitas instead of eating herbs, instead of eating all this green stuff, eating that meat. And I opened my Bible, discouraged that day about the food I was eating, And there was that verse, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. You know what? He can give you guidance for your day as you open up the Word of God. This needs to become more precious to us than what it is if you want to know the will of God for your life. 
who says, I just don't know the will of God for my life. And I ask these things. Look, when I, when I say stuff to you, I never say it because I'm trying to hurt you. I always say it because I'm trying to help you. Somebody asked me that recently, and I said, I'm going to ask you this. And I don't ask it in a legalistic sense. I ask it in a, in a concerned sense. How often do you open your Bible and get in it? Because if you don't, and you're trying to figure out what the will of God is, then you are tying your hands behind your back and your feet together trying to figure out how to run a race. You're going nowhere fast. You know what else you need to figure out for your life? You need some spiritual counselors in your life. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 11. It just occurred to me that I'm not having you turn to a lot of these, and you might say, what I need a Bible for you, and have you turn there anywhere. So you can get in my lap for a little while. Proverbs 11. Now, if you don't have this verse marked, mark it. If you're using a phone, don't use a permanent marker on the, on the screen. You'll, you'll be upset later. Proverbs 11, verse number 14. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitudes of counselors, there is what? Well, there's safety if you can get some people around you that are spiritual people around you. Well, there's safety in that. The problem is most of the time we're not asking because we really don't want to hear the answer. Or we will shop around and find people that we can ask that we know is going to tell us what we want to hear instead of what the Bible says or what is spiritual for us. Let me make a statement to you. Make sure it's a spiritual counselor. And then had a friend, and he told him exactly what he wanted to hear. And this is, I've told this before. And then had a friend, and it was even a family member. And told him exactly what he wanted to hear and got him in a, a load of mess. And let me tell you something. Watch this now. This is great. This is golden. This is your nugget for the night. That when it finally collapsed and Amnon was dying and his brother was killing him for what he did and he was dying, off in a different place dying, the very guy that said, go ahead and do what you were doing is at the king's house saying, don't worry, king, it's just the one kid that's dead, not all of them. You know, the question, the statement I've got is, the people that will give you bad advice and get you in trouble, where are they at when you're having to suffer for it? You need spiritual advisors, people in your life that are spiritual, that will tell you things that you might not want to hear. And then you better get your mind wrapped around the fact that sometimes they'll tell you things you don't want to hear, and you've got to guard how you respond. Listen, Nathan came to David and pointed his finger in his, in his face and said, Thou art the man. Now, Nathan didn't do that because he hated him. And Nathan surely didn't do it because he was hoping he would gain some prestige. Nathan was really running the risk of getting killed. And David had to say, You're right, and I've sinned, and I need to get right. Spiritual counselors. Look at the next one. Ecclesiastes, you're right there in Proverbs. You're going to read this tomorrow, maybe, if you read through Ecclesiastes tomorrow, chapter 5. Today is the 4th, and everybody's been saying, May the 4th, may the 4th be with you. Everybody's done that all day today. Oh, crazy Star Wars fanatics. At least you're not a Star Trek fanatic. I, I at least give you that. You know, that's the two things out there. It's either a cat people or dog people, Star Wars people or cat, or, uh, or, uh, or, <laughs> no. So I, I really think the Star Wars people are more like dog people. I think the Star Trek people are more like cat people. I think that's probably what it really is. Anyway. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Look at, look at verse 1, Ecclesiastes 5. Keep thy foot when thou goest in the house of God, and be more ready to say it than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. You know what you need to be ready to do when you walk in the house of God? You better be ready to hear something. So scriptures are needed. Spiritual counselors 
are needed. Let me tell you something else you hear when you come in the house of God that you ought to be listening to is sermons. Now, I'm not talking about entertainment, and I'm not even against they, I'm not even against all, I'm just saying, what I'm saying is you better hang your hat on the preached word of God. Paul said, I don't want your, your faith to stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, in the word of God. And let me ask you a question. Do you think it is by accident? Do you think it's by coincidence that the very things that you're going through in life, you walk into this place and you sit down and then I open up the Bible and it's not because I've been peeping in your windows, checking your emails. I don't even have your Facebook accounts. How do you think it is that we get up here and open the book and preach the word and it's exactly what you're dealing with? Or let me go a step further than that. It's the same thing you've just heard in Sunday school and then you turn around and hear it in the pulpit. How many times has that happened? It's not by accident. It's not by accident. You're saying, God, give me direction. And then a preacher gets up and says, you need to do this or you're to do that. And all they're doing is just showing you what the word of God says. And you need to be making adjustments to your life based on the truths of God's word being preached to you. Somebody said, I've made, that's a life changing sermon. I've changed my life so many times. I don't know who I am. But I am telling you, You've got to make adjustments to your life in the will of God. Look, when you leave here tonight, you know what you're not going to do? I hope you're not going to do it. You're not going to get in your car, turn on your car, and, and then just never turn the steering wheel and drive to your house. Because if you do that, you're going to have some problems in just a few feet out here. You know what you're going to have to do? You've got to make a series of adjustments. Based on the light you've got right in front of you, you'll have to look at that light and make a series of adjustments. You know what you've got? You've got the light in front of you that you'll have to make a series of adjustments in your life in order for you to get to your final destination. And you're going to have to listen. Scriptures, spiritual counselors, sermons. You know, I was at a meeting one time and it was interesting because I just, I hadn't talked to this person in a long time. I talked to him real recent. And, uh, and it brought back this to my memory and kind of confirmed to me that this is the right direction for this. But I was at a meeting one time with a man, and, and we were both around the same age. I think he may be a little bit younger than me. And uh, we were in Georgia and Atlanta, and Brother Shemish was preaching in the church there. And me and this other guy and Stacy and a few other people were there. And, uh, and he preached in the morning, and they had a break in the afternoon. And in the meantime, this, this other guy, it's a friend of mine, he said, I feel like God, he's 26 years old, he said, I feel like God wants me to quit everything I'm doing, and I'm just going to go into full-time evangelism. And I hadn't preached very much in his life before that, and hadn't done a whole lot of different stuff. And he said, I just feel like God wants me to quit. I said, yeah, but you've got a family. How are you going to support them? People will just buy me groceries. I'll take, it'll take care of me. God will just take care of me. I just, I feel confident based on the, I just, this feeling I've got, I just want to do it. I said, well, let's just do this. Let's just, we we're both kind of young and trying to figure it out. And he said, let's just pray between the services. Let's get in the back room. They said, well, you got a nursery back there. Nobody's using it. We went and got in there. And between the, the, the morning break and the afternoon when it started back up, again, we back got back in there and prayed. I don't know how long. It was, I don't know, two or three hours. We were just back there praying. We came out and we got back in the seats. And Brother Shemesh got up to preach. And as he got up to preach, he said, I, you know, I had a sermon and he had his notes and he laid them out and he sat there for a second. And he folded them up and he said, I'm just not going to preach this, I'm going to do something different. And he folded them up and put them up. And he began to preach, and, and I don't remember the, all the stuff with the sermon, but I do remember this. He started telling a story about a 26-year-old man at their church that had stepped out into stuff that God had never told him to do and he wasn't supposed to do, and how bad it ended up for him. And me and that guy next to me looked at each other like, that is unbelievable. I'm telling you that God can give you stuff just in, as people open up the Bible and preach you the word of God, you can get direction for your life. What else does God use? Because he's interested in pointing you. Look, that's enough. You've got sermons. You've got spiritual people around you. You've got all these things. You, you, you've got the scriptures. You've got everything pointing you to the things of God. Why? Because God's interested in you knowing his will. But he gives you the spirit, spirit of God as well. In John 16, 13, it says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into what's true and get you to where you need to be. 
That's the Spirit of God in your life. And like I just told you, the Spirit of God will never lead you somewhere the Word of God has not led you to. And let me say lastly, there's situations God will put you in your life. He can open doors and close doors to help you understand what the will of God is for your life. Now, with all that being said, with all that being said, can you see that there are so many avenues to figure out the will of God for your life? There is so much available for you to know what God's will is for you. Now, here's the problem. Just like with salvation, you can receive it and get the blessings, or you can reject it. Now, when you receive it, and you submit to it, and you walk in it, you're going to walk in the blessings that come along with it. But you know what you've got to do? Listen now, you can't just open your Bible and say, I read it. You can't get a spiritual counselor that tells you things and then just hear them but never do anything with it. You can't come in here and sit in a, ser- a, sit in a service and listen to something preach and then walk out and never make any kind of adjustment to your life. You can't have the Holy Spirit in you telling you what to do and you not doing anything with it. You've got to be a doer, not just a hearer. In Philippians 4, 9, Paul said these things, those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. Those things that you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, say it, do. He says this, and the God of peace shall be with you. Listen, you say, I want the will of God for my life. I want the peace of God in my life. I want the things in my life that I I really need something in my life. I need God to direct my life. Then the things that you have seen, the things that you have heard, the things that you have learned, you have got to do those things. If you don't do them, there's nothing that comes from them. Here's my question. Are you listening? Are you listening or are you distracted by life? Are you listening or are you more concerned with popularity and what the phone's got? And Are you listening to what God's trying to lead you to do in your life? Let me ask you another question. Are you listening, but will you do something with it? There are Christians in churches all over the place, even tonight on a Wednesday night. And they have understood that God's will is for them to get saved, but that's all they know is that I'm supposed to be saved. They have no clue how to walk with God from that moment on. Let me make a couple of statements, we'll be done. You can receive it, and you can walk in the blessings of it. Or this is what a lot of people do. You can reject it, not submit. Here's another thing people do all the time, put it off. Or just flat out rebel against the, the will of God. And let me tell you a few things that you might find, and a lot of people have this right now in their life. You could end up experiencing some things. One of them would be the long-suffering of God. And I'm thankful for the long-suffering of God. That he continues to put up with me when I don't listen. Number two, you can experience in the chastening of God in your life. The Bible says that God chastens those that he loves. In Hebrews 12 and verse number 9, it says this. And let's turn there because I... Again, I want to make sure that you're, you're, you're with your Bible. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 9. Watch what it says. We're going to turn to one other place after this. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers in our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not rather, much rather, be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For verily, verily, for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, for they, that's chasten after their own pleasure, but he, watch this, for our profit, 
that we might be partakers of his what? Holiness. Now here's the thing that all of us would say amen to right here. No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. Now that right there in your Bible, you ought to write duh right next to that. But grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. You know what God's trying to do? God's trying to make correction in your life, not because God hates you, but because God loves you. I saw, I, I wrote it in the notes for these guys the other day, but I saw a, a goat one time driving on the road, and I was, I saw a farm next to it. It was a big fence, and there was a goat on the other side of the fence, and he had a big tire around his neck. And I thought, what a, what a dumb goat. He's got a tire wrapped around his neck. And he was at the fence, and he was trying to eat, and he couldn't hardly eat because because this big stupid tire and and I and I went to I was driving and I went to someplace I don't remember I talked to somebody that was older than me and worked in farms been around animals you might know why that tire was on his was around his neck any of you you good Tennessee people you know why it was around his neck I found this out somebody told me because he keeps jumping the fence so he stuck a great big tire around his neck so he couldn't jump the fence now you say, well, that's just mean. No, I'm going to tell you something. That farmer loved that goat a whole lot. You know what the problem is on the other side of that fence? There's cars driving up and down that road. Could have hit that, that goat and killed him. Sometimes God will put a tire around your neck that you're thinking, what in the world are you doing? But it's there for a reason to keep you out of trouble. Now, I know, look, I saw somebody look over at a friend of theirs just now and said, you must be the tire around my neck. I know. <laughs> Some of you husbands look at your wife going, you're the tire, and they're thinking, nope, it's you. <laughs> I'm just telling you, God's not trying to hurt you. God's trying to help you. I told them last night that whenever I was in, uh, when I was in the military, I, I hate heights. I've never liked heights. I've never appreciated heights. I don't like, I, 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 this may be too high for me. I don't, I don't know. This, I hate heights. And I told them this. I've told you this before, and this sounds really sexist, and I'm sorry if it does. I don't mean it to be. I'm, I'm saved now, so I probably don't feel the same way anymore. But the only reason why I went to air assault school, they, they, they think you jump out of a helicopter. The only reason why I went is because there was females in our company that had gone already. And when they said, we'd like to send you to air assault school, I was thinking, no way. And then I saw this young lady that was this little bitty thing. She had an air assault tab on her chest, and I was like, if she did it, there ain't no way in the world I ain't going to go. <laughs> and so I went. And I, and I made it through air assault school. I hate heights. And I told them that when I was in basic, I was 18 years old, and we went to what they call a confidence course to give you confidence. <laughs> and part of the confidence course was something they called the stairway to heaven. Remember that one? Some of you guys? And they had telephone poles stacked on top of the telephone pole down here. You stand on it. There's another telephone pole about this high up. So Brother McMurray would just climb up it and come down with no problem. And me, I, about this high. Brother McMurray is the guy that was trying to get me, hey, you want to go flying in a plane? I hate heights. Brother McMurray said, you want to go flying in a plane? I said, no, not really. He said, well, I, I got something coming up in this date. And I was, I was thankful to find out that I had something planned for that date. And Billy Murray said, what about this date? And I said, I really don't like flying. And this is what he said. Oh, man, it was great. He said, preacher, I don't ever, ever, ever want to hear you preach a sermon on faith ever again if you won't go fly with me. <laughs> well, for a preacher, that's like saying I double dog dare you. That's, that's what that is. I was like, all right, let's go. I'm telling you, though, listen now. This was, I'll get back to the other story in just a second. I'll tell you. But look, but he, got me in that, he got me there with the airplane. And I'm telling you, it was a Volkswagen with wings. We were up against each other the whole time, right? Right up against each other. I mean, you have to be shoulder to shoulder in this little plane. And the door wouldn't shut. It wouldn't shut. And he's like, oh, we'll work on it. I'm like, if you've got to work on it, I don't really want to ride in it. And so we, we went off to go, and then we had to come back and get another one. And, and really, we went out, and we came back, because it, it was messed up. And I thought, thank you, Lord, it's messed up. We can't go out. And they said, no, though, they found a different plane we can get in. 
It was equally as small. We got in it, we took off, we fly, we're flying, and we go to a certain place, we land, and when we land, Brother McMurray, who is really trying everything about me, says, you know, that's one of the best landings I've ever had. <laughs> now, here's the problem. That's not the only landing. we got to fly back. Now, if that was the best one, <laughs> I wonder how the rest of them are going to be. I hate, I hate heights. And so I get in the basic training. I got that first one, and I got the next little one. And it, so you got to climb up on the telephone pole. You got to stand on that one. And you got to get to the next one. It's up here. And, you gotta, and you're going way up in the air. I mean, it's like three stories. Four, I don't know how many three stories. I don't know how many how tall it is. It's way up in the air. And you got to keep doing it. And you're getting way up. And I hate heights. So this is what I did. I skipped it and went to the next obstacle. I don't know how they figured it out, but they figured out that I had not done it. So they gathered everybody together and made me do it by myself. With everybody watching, and the drill sergeant, I told them this yesterday, was up on the top rung, laid on his side, laying on the top rung, just laying there with his leg wrapped around it, on his elbow like this, watching me, and I'm trying to go up this thing, and he's calling me every filthy thing you can think of. I told them, he was talking about me, he talked about my mama, he talked about my dad, he talked about everybody. It was just filthy. He just constantly, and I'm going up, and he's telling me just how sorry, good for nothing, rotten, I am all the way, and I get to the very top, and this is the, this is the interesting part of this. I got to the very top, and I, and I climb over the top. I'm holding on to it, and as I got to the top, he whispered to me. He said, son, you're doing a good job. He said, you just go back down the same way you just came, and we no problems. Like, this guy's human. I thought he was a cyborg or something. He's, he's I started going back down as I'm going back down. You dirty, rotten, sorry. And, he started, and I thought, and it occurred to me. Right then, it occurred to me. That guy wasn't trying to hurt me. That guy was trying to help me. He was trying to help me get over me so that I would not be scared when it came to doing stuff in combat. Let me tell you something. You can, God's the same way in the sense of helping you without the cuss words. God's not trying to hurt you, but I'm going to tell you something. You start rejecting. You start getting away. Listen real close. You start saying, I ain't listening to this. I ain't listening to spiritual counselors. I'm not listening to, in the church service. I'd rather take a nap. It's a nice, comfortable place to take a nap. I don't need to hear. I don't need to do. I don't need to listen. I don't need to submit. You know what you may find yourself doing? Chasing a God. You might find yourself with a Jonah saying, I'm going the other way, and you hit a storm, and then you find yourself in the belly of the whale. God did not do this to try to hurt him. God did that to try to help him get on track. You may find yourself, listen to this, feeling abandoned. Where's God at in my life? You might find yourself feeling very much like that. You know what the prodigal son felt one day? He used up all his, all his substance on riotous living. And then one day he found himself sitting in a hog pen all by himself, eating the husks, eating pig's food. You know what he might have been thinking? When he, where's all the friends I used to party with? Where's all the money I used to have? Where's the Father? Where's God in all this mess? Listen, God didn't put you there. The Father didn't put you there. Your friends didn't put you there. Your rebellion put you there. And you may feel very like, man, I'm all alone sitting in this spot. I don't know what to do. Well, you've got to do exactly what the prodigal did. Get up and run to the Father's house. You may find that in your life. And I want you to just look at the last verse, and I promise, the last verse. 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse number 19. This is, this is it right here. 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 2, verse number 20. Watch what it says. 2 Timothy 2, 20. But in a great house, but not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth. Watch. And some to honor and some to dishonor. Realize in the house of God, there's some people that God can say, now that is a vessel of honor. And you know what else he can say? That over there is a vessel that has been very dishonorable. If a man therefore purge himself from these, so he should be a vessel of honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, prepared to every good work. Flee also youthful lusts and follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them. Follow with, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Get together with those that follow the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strife. Then he goes through the servant of God. He's going to try to help people that are off track and 
God's going to try to give you repentance, the rest of verse number 25. And in verse number 26, you're going to have to recover yourselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him and his will. Now, here's what I want you to get. I told you that you can find yourself experiencing the long-suffering of God. That would be good. All right, how about the chastening of God? That's not so good. You may feel very abandoned, alone, by yourself. Where's God? Where's my friends? Where's everything at? Because I don't know where I'm at because I haven't been following God very well. Let me tell you something else you might be. You might become a vessel of dishonor that ends up in the snare of the devil. And let me tell you, listen to this. You end up for the rest of your life being an illustration of what to not be in life. People say, honey, remember cousin so-and-so? Remember how bad they how that bad they turned out? How they wrecked their whole life? They ended up in prison? Yeah. You, you remember brother so and so and so you know how they they messed up everything they lost everything they lost their, their their wife they lost their children because they just wouldn't listen they wouldn't do what was right they ended up messing up their life up yeah don't be like that person they're an example of what not to be you tell you what you can be if you just keep trying to do it your way instead of doing it god's way you become an example for people to say remember brother and sister so and so don't make the same mistake they did they're in the house but they're showing you how to be dishonorable, not honorable. And you may find yourself in the snare of the devil. And let me just say this. Lastly, watch this now. Listen, I was so glad that Pastor Robinson said this a while ago. He said, boy, this morning, he said on Sunday morning, grandson, grandson taught Sunday school. My son preached Sunday morning, and I preached Sunday night. You know what that is? A legacy was left of doing honorable things. You know what happens if you start doing dishonorable? You won't follow the word. Listen, you won't follow the word of God. You don't care to open the Bible and see what it says. You won't listen to sermons. You won't follow the spirit of God. You don't care about getting a spiritual anybody in your life to tell you how to do it. And you will not submit to it. You want to do it your way. I want to do what I want to do. Don't tell me anything. You know what you become? You become not only a vessel of dishonor, but you begin to sow dishonor into the next generation. You think you're, 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 you're just telling your kids, ah, we, got, we, got, we need time for better things. You're not. You're telling them that God don't matter. You're telling them that the word of God is not as important as what we want to do. You're telling them that the spirit of God doesn't matter. You know what you're telling them? Man, I hope to God I don't, I don't be this example. I pray to God I don't, I'm not this example. And listen, if people see me being this example, you come get me and you make me do right. But I don't want to lead my daughter in a way that is wrong and have her grow up thinking that God don't matter, the Bible don't matter, that spiritual people don't matter, that the Spirit of God don't matter, that the sermons we hear at church don't matter. And when we go home and we talk about, well, I just don't believe that's the way it should be done. Well, they're just talking about the Bible, but we really don't do all of that in our home. We do something completely different. And when we go home, and look, your kids are out there and you're in here. When we go home and your kids are sitting in service and listening to us preach the Bible, preaching our guts out with the Bible, and then we go home and do the exact opposite of what the Bible says, you are sending a message to the next generation. I'm telling you, I don't want it. I don't want to see the next. I don't want to see the next generation mess up like some of them have messed up in this generation. In the Father's house, boy, there's some things that are honorable, some things that are dishonorable. I want you to be honorable, not for my glory. Good grief! I want you to be honorable for God's glory. And I want you to be honorable for the next generation to be able to see a target to shoot at, to know what to do. But you can't tell me, I just don't know what God wants. I gave you a, man, enough, enough Bible to choke a horse tonight. You can't tell me that in that, you can walk out of here and say, I just don't know what God wants. You, somebody can't stand before God and says, I just didn't know you wanted me to be saved. 
And nobody's going to be able to stand before God and say, I just didn't know what you wanted me to do. God's got so much pointing in the right direction. The problem is, are you listening? And then we can do something with it. Let's stand. Well, Father, we just come to you tonight and ask you to help us. Help me tonight, Lord. Lord, I, I say this by testimony in front of them with their ears, but, but speaking to you. Lord, this week your word has confirmed things. Spiritual counselors around me have told me things that are the same things your word has said, same things your spirit has said. And Lord, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything should be established. And Father, it's my responsibility now with what your word has said, your spirit said, and your spiritual counselors have said, I've got to apply it to my life. Father, I pray you'd help me to do it. And I pray you'd help these people to do it. Now, Father, I pray your Holy Spirit would bear witness in something in this that's been said. And I pray you'd help these people to be bold enough, courageous enough to just step into your truth and begin to apply it to their life. Help them now. Lord, we love you. We ask you to bless in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're going to play, why don't you pray tonight? Just very quickly, let's pray. Maybe you say, Lord, I'm sorry. I just haven't been listening to you like I should. I'm sorry. But I need to from now on. I need to be listening. I'm going to listen to sermons. I'm going to, I'm going to take notes. I'm going to go home and apply them. I'm going, to, I'm going to look for spiritual guidance, and I'm going to apply it to my life. But I'm not going to listen to it just thinking, boy, I hope I can find somebody else to tell me what I want. I'm going to listen, and I'm going to apply it. Maybe some of you would say, you know what, I need to commit to getting back in my Bible again daily and reading my Bible. Some of you need to say, well, the things that I've seen and heard and learned, I need to do them. And I'm going to make a commitment tonight to start doing what your word says to do. And I pray that some of you tonight say, God, please help me. Don't be a vessel of dishonor. Please help me don't, not to be a bad example to the next generation. Some of you just say tonight, Lord, thank you for correcting me and getting me on track. Listen, it, I, I said it a while ago. I, I, I said it and I mean it and the word said it. Boy, no chastening is joyous in the moment. But it does something for us. Thank you for being in church tonight. Listen, if you don't have it, you say, I didn't bring a Bible tonight because I ain't got a Bible. Come see me. I'll give you a Bible. I'll give you a good Bible. I'll, I'll get you a really nice Bible. And um, I'll even have Brother uh, Pastor Bishop pay for it. It'll, it'll be a blessing. It'll be a good one. Make you get a good one. And, uh, but l- listen, I'm, I'm telling you, start bringing your Bible. Start getting in your Bible. Get the, listen, get a love for the Bible again. And take notes about stuff. And go home and apply it. Listen, if you, it never bothers me. Now, if you got if you need somebody to come mow your yard, you call him. You need you got a Bible question? Call me. I love answer, I love talking about the Bible. I love talking about the Bible. You can you can always we can talk. Get a hunger for the Word of God again. Start putting it in your life. Thanks for being in church. I gave him some announcements. You may give him a couple of more.